Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the podcast. We're not walking a battlefield so much today, but we're discovering a battlefield. We're digging one up. We're delving into the history of the Second World War to try and find out more about the famous blokes from Band of Brothers. And joining us to talk about it is a good mate. We've had him on the podcast before. It's Richard Osgood. Richard, thanks for joining us. Hello, Matt. Good to hear you again. Well, it's good stuff we're talking about today, mate, because we're not doing First World War or Iron mm. Age Forts or Rat Island. Band of Brothers. Now, uh, forgive me, I don't want to sound cynical, but the the idea that you would dig in a village in England yeah. that was briefly home to the men from Easy Company um, before D-Day, mm. it, 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 it doesn't seem like an Iron Age Fort or even a Rat yeah. Island or a Roman villa. I mean, tell me tell me about this. Why were you drawn well, is, to, and not just one a, year, you've done this several years in a row. Yeah, I've done it, done it a few times now. This is, a, I suppose, a bit of a strange one, but... Um, I've been wanting to. We one of the things I do in the Ministry of Defence in the UK is we administer a thing called the Protection of Military Remains Act. So every crashed aeroplane is covered by law. You can't just metal detect it or dig it. You've got to get a license from the MOD. For years, I'd wanted to excavate a couple of sites archaeologically to see what extra information you could get doing it like that. And um, one of the sites I'd sort of considered was a B-17, one of the big American bombers that had flown and crashed near this village of Oldbourne. And this plan actually came to nothing in the end, but the chap that was showing me around said, oh, I'll show you a, um, a small museum I've set up in a stately home nearby, a place called Littlecote House, which is a Tudor manor house, and, and it was dedicated, in fact, to the 101st Airborne. And I asked him why I did this. He said, well, because Easy Company was based just down the road in Oldbourne. And from my point of view, I was thinking, well, I wonder what you can get archaeologically using the same techniques you'd use for a Roman fort or a, um, a prehistoric burial mound, but looking at a 20th century perspective and for me it seemed to work as a good idea working alongside these veterans i mentioned before doing archaeology as part of their recovery because it's part of their tribal narrative their own heritage their own history because they'll recognize the military kit um they'll probably have watched the television series um which has lasted remarkably well i watched it recently and i think ah, that's lasted well i was trying to think also of a more famous Western Allied unit, an easy company of the, of the 101st. And I couldn't think of any. I thought maybe in Britain, 617 Squadron, the Dam Busters, maybe your Rats of Tobruk. I don't know, but it's a single entity. I, c- I couldn't think of one. So it's probably the and most a small famous. group as well. A, you know, yeah, a, very, for, yeah, and, yeah, very know, small group. About, yeah. They're really well photographed. Um, there's loads and loads of um, footage of these guys. They do the most incredible um events you think of d-day obviously um but then of course there's um bastone there's the uh, the arnhem campaign they go to the eagle's nest at the end so they do everything from post 1944 onwards and so they are a, a, a unit with a huge amount of history and i just thought maybe we could see that there would be some archaeology left because oldbourne this little village in wiltshire it was the the longest they stayed together in any one place in the whole war they were there for nine months so they were there, billeted, unit cohesion, um, forming themselves as a, as a kind of a unit identity. They're doing a lot of training nearby, so you, maybe they were gonna, we were going to find um, bits connected with their training and about where they basically forge themselves as Easy Company before they go in on D-Day. They do come back briefly after D-Day um, for you know a, a, f- a few weeks before the, the Arnhem campaign, and then that's that's it. They've left Wiltshire after that. So did they leave a trace in these this football pitch, effectively? Um, in the nine months they were there. That, that was the mission. Don't take this the wrong way, but I assume you needed permission to do this. And did your colleagues scoff a little bit that this wasn't like real archaeology? Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. Yeah, we do need, you know, you need all the kind of permission from that. Luckily, the football pitch was owned by the um, the parish council and they all seemed, you know, relatively happy. I think they thought uh, I'd bring a load of archaeologists which would drink in their local pubs and eat the Chinese <laughs> takeaway and spend a fair amount of money, which did happen they obviously know but, um, their archaeologists pretty well they, yeah they've obviously watched <laughs> time team and seen what, see what, see what goes on there um so we, we thought that would be a good thing and i think they thought well you know we'll let them have a go and, and oldborn is, is actually quite proud of its um links to the the 101st it's got a little museum there um a heritage center which talks about its other famous things they're, they're very famous for making bells actually so a lot of collection of bells there's a uh, a Big feature on Doctor Who, the television series, because one of the episodes is filmed there, and there's some some good prehistory. So I think they were they get a lot of visitors from America still post the the television series, and they want to come and see where the, where the guys from Easy Company lived. So I think they thought I was you know um, unlikely to find anything, but but you know it's worth a go. So we did some geophysical survey, and actually there were traces of these huts. So it meant we had a, a good chance of finding something anyway. 
And you've done this, uh, so is it three years now you've done this? Yeah, we've done three years on it. The first uh, attempt was to try and find a particular hut. There's a, quite a famous photograph of one of the, the big names of Easy Company, a chap called Carwood Lipton, who was one of the sergeants. And if you've seen the TV series, he's one of the guys that plots against Sobel to try and get rid of the um, the kind of very strict commands and make sure that Dick Winters, who eventually does command Easy Company, takes more of a controlling influence. And um, there's a picture of Lipton outside this hut in Oldbourne and you can locate where this hut was because the hillside's still the same and the trees on the hills are still the same so you can stand in the same position as that photographer with the hut um, in, the, in the kind of middle distance and we thought well we, we could see where this one had existed in 1943 and thought we'd do some geophysics and it was there um, that we we thought we would we'd try the first of the excavation trenches so first first year was easy company um, second year was easy company and this year we've just tried to find where fox company was as well and another little bit of easy company it was there were numerous elements of the 506 that were in this particular area there are lots of diaries lots of photographs and um so we've got a good historic record to go with the archaeology. Um, but the key thing for me is, is trying to find those traces of those particular soldiers through the objects. And you did it in in uh, in, in uh, cooperation with Time Team this year, the we did. famous yeah, so we, TV series. We did, yes. Yeah. So we've done it um, a couple of times now. So Time Team was this year, and that will be in a, in a program that will air later on in 2023. Um, they've issued... I think various day day by day accounts that you can you can pick up on the internet at the moment on, on things like YouTube, and um, yeah, it was a good it was a good success. So what we we tend to do is we take the sort of take the turfs off with a turf cutting machine and get down to the foundations of these huts. In this, excuse me, assuming that they were still there, and the the turf cutter revealed that yes, these foundations are are there. They're different styles. Some are made of brick, which is probably where where Fox Company were located, and Easy Company had concrete footings. And these are Quons or Nissen huts, you know, the famous um, semi-cylindrical corrugated iron shelters that you could put up in, you know, three hours. A decent team could put one of these up in about three hours. Um, and that's where, where these guys were located. Um, you had 16 of them in one of the huts at a, what's called a pot-bellied stove in one of them to keep warm. I think it must have been quite an emotional experience being in one of these in winter in Wiltshire. It certainly was even actually in spring. It was quite wet. And so, yeah, you read some of the accounts. They painted them in, in different colours, um, quite gaudy, and um, and lived in them for nine months whilst they were training in the hills and the in the fields nearby um, prior to going off to D-Day. And I just think that must be must have been quite an extraordinary time for these people before this maelstrom of D-Day going in because these guys go in before the, the beach landings of course they're in in the very very first waves before um, Utah and Omaha Beach and the American landings there um, to make sure that they're taking out some of the, the German stronger positions and the gun emplacements that are going to be putting fire down on the, on the landing beaches um, so these there must have been a, a very curious time of relative calm before they they drop in 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 what must have been hell, frankly. Do we have accounts from the men of Easy Company in their own words describing what it was like to be in England? Because it must have been a, a solace, as you say, before the storm, and you yeah. know they've come from training in America, and this is their first taste of Europe. It must have been an extraordinary culture shock to find themselves Absolutely. in this little pretty village in the in yeah. the Wiltshire countryside. Yeah, you're, you're quite right, and um, I think it must have been must have been extraordinary some of these guys before they maybe went to georgia for uh, tokoa um to do the, the basic jump training um, around kurahi uh, it, it may well have been the first time they'd left their state and then they they suddenly find themselves in in britain well they take um the troop ship over from america to, to the uk uh, they arrive in liverpool and then they take um, various trains down at night time to get to Oldbourne. um and a chap called david kenyon webster who was a, an english major he's a very um a bright academic private soldier he refers to the fact that when they got up in the morning they, they thought they'd arrived on a hollywood film set because you've got this bucolic village with um a hollywood hollywood style um fairy tale cottages with thatch roofs uh, and things like that and very quaint and absolutely impenetrable money Money. I don't know. I couldn't. I still can't understand British money pre pre decimalisation. So goodness knows what <laughs> what these American lads made of it. And you know, they're in a war zone. So they're they're they've got they're, they're seeing people who've had you know years of privation and they're under rationing. Um, and a lot of, of course, the British troops are are away fighting elsewhere um, in in other theatres. So it must have been um, a very curious thing to find to find to find yourself in this beautiful location but knowing that the end point is going to be something really quite visceral um so yes the, a number of them do write about it um in, usually local, in, in fairly decent terms 
what, what do the what local people so- think to have all these Yanks descending on their town, descending yeah. quite literally often yeah. from the sky? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, it, you know, I think it, I think it probably varied. I think there were, there, there must have been. Um, the conflicts and we've we've seen um some quite fun cartoons of british people getting annoyed at the amount of americans in the pub so they can't get to get their own beer because the americans are in the queue um i think there were there's certainly a lot of hearts and minds campaigns that the americans ran pretty successfully there were some definitely some gi gi brides um there were quite a few kids that were born locally um spears who lieutenant spears who was in fact in dog company he did join easy company um, and one of the, again, one of the famous characters in the TV series, you may recall, he's the one that allegedly machine guns the, the prisoners um, when, when they when they capture a lot of Germans. He's um, he gets married in the local church um, in Oldbourne, and there are there are numerous others. Uh, there's another chap who's um, uh, turns out his 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 grandmother um, she she hooked up one one of the American uh, soldiers. He was a medic. He wasn't actually meant to go. Um, on D-Day, but he didn't want to miss the the overall event. So he effectively stows away on one of the the C-47s, the Dakotas, which was the one that uh, Lieutenant Meehan, who commanded Easy Company, was on. And this thing shot down, um, and the crashes. They all they're all killed. And so um, his grandmother is is left um, pregnant um, by this GI. And so he's got a, a grandfather who was a medic on Easy Company, but 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 never met him. So I think that was probably relatively common story and the kids that we met who are now it's very strange because these these kids that were running around blagging chewing gum off the americans and things like that um they're now old men of course so we got old men coming to our, our excavation site and um talking about the american presence and um where one of these guys had a, a little toy monkey a, a cuddly monkey called switzy the monkey and um his his mom. How did he put it? It was quite delicate. He said his his, his mother struck up a close personal friendship with one of the <laughs> uh, one of the American officers. Who, very very who, close, from the sounds of it. Very close friendship. Yeah. And he, um, this, in fact, this um, this guy um, gives this kid's toy monkey um, a screaming eagle badge and an airborne badge and so you think oh my goodness he's got a his toy has got this these easy company badges that are probably worth a fortune and um this the he did say to me i i don't know what happened to this officer and you know we did the research and sadly the officer was very badly wounded in carantan um which is one of the the early engagements of easy company and um he's then medevaced to initially to, to near utah beach and then to to cambridge in the uk and then his flight, he's flown back to the States because he's that badly wounded, but his flight crashes into the sea and he's killed. Um, so, oh, no. <laughs> so he sort of dies of wounds, but it's, um, yeah, it's a, well, quite a convoluted tale. But um, I think I think the Americans made made a huge impact um, on on the Brits. I mean, there's the that classic line of the, the Americans were overpaid, oversexed, and over here, um, that the Brits used to refer to it. But, um, you know, these guys in sharp uniforms who haven't had, you know, they're very physically fit they haven't had the privations and uh, of of rationing and all this sort of thing um, but they're there fighting a common cause i think they did probably make quite a big mark in oldborn and since then a lot of americans have come back a lot of the veterans did return to oldborn to visit their um their old haunts and their families have come since and there are still believe it or not band of brothers tours that come over from america to visit the the main fighting places in normandy and, and and the netherlands and places like that but also to see the village where in many ways it, it all began um in the sort of fighting um perspective which was which was wiltshire it's fascinating to talk about those relationships between service people and the local people and in my collection i have a book a, a, a bound book which was from the second world war and it's designed for americans to explain what life will be like in australia and uh, it's it's a yeah. fascinating. It's it's yeah. wonderful to get that perspective of Australia from a foreigner, not just from a foreigner, but from a, from a foreign government that talks about how much tea the Australians drink and virtually no oh, coffee, right? and they they eat an extraordinary amount of lamb. And you, you know, so sheep in Australia aren't just for wool; they're also eaten by the local people, if you can believe <laughs> that. Goodness but it's me. a it's a it's a big PR exercise because, yes. as you say, hearts and minds. It was so essential, and I've seen posters. I think there's one in the uh, Villas Bretno Museum in uh, in France. Uh, which shows a picture of an Australian with a slouch hat on, and it says, "This is an Aussie digger. He's a friend of America." You know, so it, it, it really was that that hearts and minds uh, perspective, the, the idea that it was a collaboration. We're all in it together against the nasty Germans. It, it yeah. was a really important part of the whole process. Absolutely, and you know this this sort of replication from from the first world war. You know, you and I have talked about machines for, on on many an occasion, and uh, you know, um, I'm sure many of your listeners know that the the Australian Third Division comes in slightly later to the war in the First World War, and they do their training for machines um, on Salisbury Plain, uh, you know, where I'm where I'm based, and um, 
this is a detonation of mines that Pluma, no, sorry, sorry, that uh, Monash puts together as being part of Pluma's army, but uh, Monash gets the training so in so much detail that it's a huge success. But again, there is still the the, the phenomenon for the Brits of you've got a huge arising of, of people from totally different culture in many ways arriving in your small village in Wiltshire. I mean, Till's Head, where I'm based, they had the Canadians, including with Winnie the Pooh, um, the mascot Winnipeg the Bear, genuinely. Um, we had the New Zealand uh, with, the, with the Maori Pioneer Corps, and of course the Australian Third Division. And there are there are numerous cartoons of Australians in a very similar light to the Americans in the Second World War. Of, you know, the locals being 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 told about you know Aus- Australians coming here and fighting for the same cause. So it is this thing of you've got to do your um, your hearts and minds campaign and make make it very clear both to the the soldiers coming in, but but also to the locals that it is going to be a strange cultural experience. But you are fighting for the same cause, um, and um, they certainly did that for Easy Company um, at Oldbourne. There was even a training film by the I can't remember the name of the actor, but the 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 actor is the guy that plays Rocky's trainer. In the in the film Rocky, and he's the leading actor, telling you about the uh, um, how the Brits drink ridiculous beer and um, <laughs> it's warm and all sorts of strange stuff like that. And they've got this game called darts and and stuff stuff like that, and it's really charming looking looking back on it. But um, you know, probably probably quite important. I, I know what my experience of it is that when we put certainly from um, veterans of a modern perspective, you know, British soldiers next to Australian soldiers next to um, American soldiers of recent campaigns together. There's there's a lot of humour, there's a lot of banter, but um, they all do seem to get on pretty well because they're all part of the same tribe as in soldiers. Um, and that, I think the soldiering experience probably from at least those three nations is probably quite a, quite a similar experience. Is there a, a pub in the town, Richard, where you know that Easy Company used to come in and have a beer at the end of the day? Yeah, there is, and uh, we we certainly helped support that this year. Um, there's there's two two one there were there were I think there were five pubs when Easy Company were there in in the forties. There are two that survive, and um, one of them is the the Crown, and that's the other Anks pub. And if you go in there today, there are lots of photographs of the old veterans when they'd returned. Um, people like Wild Bill Garnier and Babe Heffron when they came back. Um, so there's them as as young soldiers and photographs of them, you know, um, nowadays. In fact, if you watch Band of Brothers, Babe Heffron does make a, a little cameo appearance which is quite sweet you know he's one of the liberated villages in uh, in um eindhoven he's sitting there outside the pub and it's one of the real members of easy company so he uh, th- that's the other ranks pub and then the officers tend to drink in the blue boar which is up by the church and again it's a it's quintessential great name great name. Oh, it's a great great name <laughs> great pub very pretty pub um you know half timbered and looking out over the village green um the village green's super um it's got the, the it's a 13th century church with Tudor icons in it um, and we had a curiosity last time we dug there um, last year because we had one of the Australian infantrymen who was on his recovery program a guy called Scotchy who had a Australian regiment and um, he was out there we were drinking in the Blue Boar and he was chatting to his his mum about it and she said did you know your grandmother used to live in Oldbourne in Wiltshire if it's the same place and it, indeed it was and sent a photograph over and we found it it was the house nearest to the church so complete fluke it was Utter serendipity. We didn't know, but yeah, Scotchy, uh, um, you know, emphasising the closeness of the nations, even in uh, in coming back to dig with us, and that's a, uh, um, yeah, that was a, a nice tangential thing we had. Um, but it's it's always good to have. Um, we had this. Uh, we've had this uh, uh, on most of our sites. Have veterans of different nations working together, and of course, when we're working on the Band of Brothers project, having American veterans and servicemen and women is a great thing um, because you can see how much it does mean to them because it is an important part of their. Their, their national military history um, and when they're finding I don't know Garand rounds that have been held by members of certainly the 506 parachute regiment probably from where we were from by members of easy company that's that is that's quite a rush to be honest as uh, you know from a Brit that's a rush but from an American who's grown up watching the TV series Band of Brothers that's that's really quite something and speaking of the TV series you had some of the actors come out from time to time as well yeah, we did. Um, we it's that's another really, really good thing. Um, the uh, may you, you listeners may know that quite a few of the actors are are Brits. In fact, most of them are Brits. Um, so the guy that plays um, the, the Dick Winters is uh, you know Damien Lewis, very famous British actor. But lots of the others are British as well. So we had um, one of our stalwarts is a chap called Tim Matthews who plays Pencala in the TV series, and Pencala is killed in the village of Foy in the Ardennes. Uh, he's hit with a uh, with an 88 millimeter round, um, but so Tim comes along and it usually brings um, 
bring some of the others. So Shane, who played Doc Rowe, um, he's he's been along, and we've had uh, Rick Warden, who plays um, Harry Welsh, who features very heavily in Carrington. He's he's come along, um, and it's great. It's lovely, and uh, what, what's nice is is to see. Um, my veterans who've grown up with the TV series being excited and getting all the autographs and then, you know, seeing the actors being quite bemused because they're only playing at being soldiers, whereas my veterans have done it done it for real. So they know what it's really been like. And um when you're making good finds at the same time and um the the guys that played band the actors the actors in the Band of Brothers, um, they went to boot camp for ages. So they formed a really strong bond and they do still meet up with one another um and have reunions they'll probably i'm imagining going over to be probably in normandy as we speak given that yesterday was the anniversary of d-day um and so for them it's, it's quite a thrill to be able to see where their characters were and they really do identify with the characters that they played in the tv series and of course none of easy company are alive anymore so it's in many ways keeping the memory of those 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 boys of 43 and 44 going um that that keeps keeps them and their uh, their excitement continuing i think well it's brilliant richard we should talk about the dig what what, what yeah. were you hoping to find and what did you find well it's an interesting one we 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 were hoping to find um any traces of of those soldiers both in terms of their training um their their downtime um and hopefully maybe even finding some of the british stuff because the the site was used by the british army before the americans moved in in 1943 and we were you know we were moderately successful in finding british stuff you know we're finding um charges of 303 rounds and the odd bullet the odd button um the sort of thing you find on the western front in fact you know the gs the general service button that sort of thing um but from an american perspective over over the three years we've been astonishingly lucky and I've, I've we joke amongst the team that you could put together a mannequin completely covered in um american military now that would represent a paratrooper so i think the, the you know the really exciting find and we found lots of you know grand they call them charges don't they grand charges i know they're called clips don't they clips, gl- clips grand yeah. clips and bullets um we found um lots of buttons we found um buckles that were on the on the boots made in providence rhode island it's not like doing prehistory it even tells you when the things are made so providence rhode island and as you know all the bullets have got date stamps on them so 1943 44 made in illinois and things like this uh, springfield um so that's all fun um the the real the really f- exciting things are when you're linking to the paratroopers themselves so we found um an emergency parachute pool which is painted red um it's very very definitely american we found paracord we found bits of parachute itself um we found uh, a clicker you remember the, the film the longest day actually is also in um in band of brothers where they have this kind of strange kids toy that just makes a clicking noise to identify yourself as an american soldier and you reply with two clicks well, we found one of those made um bizarrely by acme and i thought they only made things for wiley e. coyote actually but <laughs> so you've got this clicking toy um and they were only issued to the americans to the 101st uh, down at a pottery airfield in exeter on the morning when they're flying out or the, the evening when they're flying out for d-day they weren't used again because it's a one you know, one hit weapon really, because the Germans then clearly know what they're for. So this is a D-Day item, and it's come back, I mean, just chucked away or dropped in a field, in uh, in the sites where Easy Company lived. And then again, linking to the people themselves, two dog tags, one of which was to a Richard Blake, and he was a, a 21 year old, who was actually no, he was a 20 year old who was in Able Company, so one of the other companies of the 506th, and he fights on, drops in on D-Day, and then he after that goes to Arnhem where he's badly wounded and that's the end of his war but he lives you know a good old life and he died not that long ago and then the second dog tag we found was in fact a member of Easy Company it was a chap called Carl Fenstermaker who was a Protestant um, all this is written on his um, on his dog tag it's got his blood type on there and all sorts of things and he was one of um, one of the two pathfinders of Easy Company so he, again he drops in even before the paratroopers drop in before anyone else drops in and he does d-day he does market garden he drops into bastone he's one of only 20 paratroopers to drop into bastone and then he's used um as the german translator because he's a german speaker he's pennsylvania deutsch uses the german translator when they liberate um dachau the concentration camp and so you know he's done some just astonishing things and i think from all the accounts that i've read about fenstermaker who's one of the names of easy company it was the latter thing it was the dachau experience that did for him um not not necessarily his fighting experience it's the you know man's inhuman inhumanity to man um, that he found in the concentration camp and from what i was i've read he was unable to hold a job down after the war and didn't you know live for a huge amount of years after it um and as a result he's a sort of um 
you know he's a he's almost a representative of what we're trying to achieve doing this project of recovery and rehabilitation for our vets just to to enable them to have a pathway to speak about their experiences and to maybe avoid what Carl went through after the war um, so that's a powerful it's thing it's an extraordinary story and you would think that as yeah. a german speak yeah you would think that as a german speaker he would be connected uh, more viscerally to that experience because he would be able to speak to the survivors of the concentration yeah. camp where and obviously then, for the other members there was a language barrier which probably kept them at a bit of a distance maybe one stage back absolutely yeah so he he had all that um, so yeah we're we're finding these things connected with the americans we're finding you know the you know some of the fun finds of the sort of um spam tin keys and k ration keys and uh I don't know, other stuff there. The, you drink a Pepsi bottles. Um, we found some stockings in one of the huts. So again, back to your, your hearts and minds campaign, maybe going particularly well. Um, and just all the things about their, their, their life, I mean, rations and fighting elements. We found quite a bit of German ammunition as well, which is maybe a bit of a curiosity. Belted um, components from an MG34 or 42 machine gun, um, lots of uh, German um bullets we found um a fuse from mine uh, bits of german grenade and that's because they're using um german equipment which they've captured to test to see how effective this stuff is what it sounds like um the effective radius of these things and just learning about your enemy um which is the sort of thing i suppose when you think about it logically yeah that's what you'd expect or hope that they would do but they're doing this in oldborn as well so we're finding all their um, their training was probably pretty good um, and in the fields all around us um, we, we go into the fields nearby a team goes out there and finds foxholes or ops that the guys have dug in training for the battles that they're going to face and so that's a very useful uh, tool for us to see that they're doing training all around the area they're firing bazookas we have found a, f- a few of those which is a bit more emotional than the normal small arms that you find you have to treat them with a little bit maybe more respect uh, and then you get carvings in the trees and i know we we've chatted before about finding australian carvings from the third division where they trained and you can trace the names of these people and with the australian records being so good and all online you can find out exactly their service history as well we haven't had quite the same success with the americans but we have had place names and initials left by guys that are american um, and that that's another nice touch because again it's that hands-on you're putting your hand on exactly the same place where a gi was just before dropping on d-day and then you're putting yourself in their their position you know what we're going what was going through their their mind when they carved their name um yeah quite quite something it's that philosophy of soldiers to leave their mark, isn't it? That they, it is. you know, when they're facing death, and not just death, they're facing the risk of being lost in combat and disappearing from the face of the earth. So they're, they're desperate things, to leave their mark. They do. Uh, so the things soldiers will always do. There's graffiti everywhere. You look at the, I mean, I suppose the film Gallipoli, when you see the um, the, the carvings left by the French on the pyramids of Egypt, right? you know, there's, there's, there's certainly an element of truth in that. We've got English Civil War graffiti from the 17th century in fonts, and uh, there's Viking graffiti in a Neolithic chamber tomb up in, in Orkney, and they will always do it. That's one of, the, one of the things that soldiers always do. It's probably the polite thing that soldiers will always do that we can talk about <laughs> comfortably. But um, have yeah. You, it's, have uh, you seen, have you been like to the that. village of Noir in? In France, Richard, where no, the, the underground no. city, where there's a, this is an extraordinary one, where there were underground caves dug into the chalk, which had been used mm. for centuries by the local people. But during the First World War, they were actually a tourist attraction and they'd open up these caves and invite people to come and tour through them. And the obviously the British officers desperate to find healthy diversions for their troops when they weren't in the front line did organise tours of the caves with platoons of soldiers. And the soldiers using their indelible pencils thousands of them wrote their names on the ch- on the chalk walls and because of oh, the, because of the environment it's been preserved and now you can go into these small little chambers smaller than the room i'm in now absolute the walls absolutely covered with the names and 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 details of soldiers wow. who, uh, who serve there it's an extraordinary link with the first world war yeah absolutely um that, that is interesting i think got, there's a fairly similar thing in arras as well isn't there under the caves there they've got um uh, writings and we found um when we were redeveloping the artillery center at um lark hill on salisbury plain they found a load of practice trenches um, and tunnels um, used pretty close to where the busted trenches were with the third the australian third division used and there were lots of names written in pencil there and there was in fact an australian bc winner who'd written written his name on on them as well so i think yes you're quite right it's uh it's those traces of of people that are um are, i don't know when you're doing first world war stuff it's i find those incredibly moving when you're linked directly to to people that that experience those things that that you and i are fascinated in and they they live through it um yeah quite incredible 
I'm going to come back to uh, Easy Company now and, and be slightly controversial for a moment. I, I heard years ago yeah. about a, 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 an archaeological event in Gallipoli where they didn't dig anything, but they just looked for surface finds. And after a large amount of money had been spent and a lot of time had been spent, they announced their finds and they said, we found uh, bullets and we found food tins and we found scraps of uniforms. And it's really a great success. And um I heard someone say rather cynically, and I didn't agree with this, by the way, but I heard someone say rather cynically <laughs> about it. What does that tell us? That they ate food, fired their weapons, and wore clothes. Um, so I'm going to put that to you. I'm going to I'm going to put that for the layman. They go, well, we knew that Easy Company were there and were firing their weapons and practicing jumping out of planes. So what does the experience of archaeology on that side at Oldbourne tell us about Easy Company? I think it's a perfectly reasonable comment, actually. I think it's, I think it's a very it's a very fair thing to say because you're quite right. We're not changing the story of Easy Company one iota. We're not changing the um, the story of the Second World War of D-Day or anything like that. But what we find uh, by what we find, but what we are finding, from my perspective, is a real way of engaging participants. So you're getting a, a youthful generation. Um, you've got all the local school kids coming up, and they are bowled over by by what we're finding and linking to these Americans, and that's perpetuating the memory so we're not we're not changing the story but we're continuing the story we're making sure that that story and the legacy of those men continues through their memory being perpetuated in many ways um i think you know it's, it's great seeing photographs of the americans and all their kit um but if you go into a museum there's something quite powerful when you see relic quality or rusty elements of the real thing um, dropped by the real individuals um, or thrown away by the re- real individuals. So they're quite right. We're not changing anything. And yes, they did just eat food. I mean, I think there's some nice touches finding, you know, the Hearts and Minds campaign of there are a couple of female badges and stockings and stuff like that. But you'd sort of expect that. So it's not, it is not changing the story at all. Um, but it is those palpable traces and links to individual soldiers, things like Richard Blake or Carl Fenstermaker, um, that maybe would get lost in the noise of the whole thing of Band of Brothers. But these are individual people they are um, particular soldiers we are maybe pointing out that it wasn't just easy company in that field so blake wasn't easy company and there are other other units um that were there i don't think we're changing much by way of the history but we are continuing the history i think is probably the what the archaeology is giving us it's continuing that memory plus also for my veterans they enjoy it and it provides an incredible well-being experience um from that from their point of view 10 days spent in a nice field, drinking good beer with friends, chatting away around a campfire. Um, that provides an incredible experience. So may, maybe just the memories, unearthing the memories of those men of pushing 100 years ago is helping modern soldiers um, in their recovery journeys. And I think that's probably the, the really important thing about it all. Yeah, I think it's a it's a very noble cause. And, and I think keeping that history alive is very important. It's, it's, it's not enough. I talk about this all the time. People say, well, why do you go to a battlefield on a battlefield tour, for example? Can't you just read a book about it? Or can't you just watch Band of Brothers and understand what went on? Um, but as you and I will know, Richard, there's nothing like walking the ground and experiencing it firsthand. So I, I, I think it's very noble work. Um, where are the relics ending up? Are they on display? They are. Um, we've, we've just, um, we, we, we keep telling the museum they're going to have to get a new building because, uh, you know, the, the scene in Jaws where you're going to need a bigger boat, well, they, they're sending you need a bigger museum because we are filling it with rust gradually. Um, yeah, they're on display in the Oldbourne Heritage Centre. Um, so they are technically still owned by Wiltshire Museum, which is in Devizes, all the property of uh, the, the Wiltshire Museum, but um, they're on permanent loan to the local village, which means anyone who comes to the village to trace the story of Easy Company, they can see the finds of our excavation and get in, you know, close proximity with with the finds that that link you directly to those those days of the 1940s and i think that's important um that they stay as local as possible i think that you know for whatever the subject that it's all great having the british museum with wonderful things in but you know if you can have those wonderful things based locally then i'm, I'm really keen that it does stay like that and certainly in oldborn you can still see all the finds that we've made dog tags clickers bits of helmet ammunition all that sort of stuff all still there I think it's brilliant, mate. I'll, I'm, I'm heading over to the UK next month and I'll be making Old Bourne one of my uh, destinations to go and check brilliant. out. Hopefully, during the time I'm over there, hopefully you and I will get a chance. Well, we'll certainly get a chance to have many beers, but hopefully we'll Drink get a chance. Drink a 506 beer. There is such yes, a thing. We could do that. Fantastic. <laughs> And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to go out and get our hands a bit dirty and uh, do some archaeology because it's been it's been too long, mate. It's been too been long since 2007. Maybe I can so get you out to Rat Island. That'd be good. 
Oh, I love the sound of that, mate. That would make for a great podcast. We'll do that for sure. Okay, let's think on that. Nice one. Great stuff. Richard, always a pleasure to catch up, mate. And if you're listening to this, Richard's been on a couple of our other podcasts, Rad Island, uh, the Bullacore dig on the First World War tank. We we talked about that a year or two ago now. So look that one up. But um, it's great work you're doing, mate, and it's always such a great pleasure to speak with you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Always a joy. Thanks, Matt. Good to speak.